Hello, everyone. Before we get started, I would like to do a quick audio check. Please type in the Q&A box if you can hear me. Hello again and welcome to our next webinar, Tips and Tricks Working from Home, of our series, Adapting to COVID-19, Higher Ed and the Transition to Online Learning. We developed this for college and university faculty and staff to learn tips, tricks, and best practices for this accelerated transition to teaching online and working remotely. Thank you for joining us during these trying times. We hope this webinar series is a useful valuable resource for you. You can connect with us using the hashtags MCCA webinar, COVID-19, and Better Together. And please visit our website for updates. In today's session, we're sharing everything you need to know to be successful when working from home. Our presenters are Anna hernandez Blackstad, Dr. Chris DeGear, Laura Romero, Ambrosia Harrison. We will begin first with Anna. She has served as Dean of Students at Anglo-American University in Prague, Czech Republic since 2019. Anna has lived in Prague since 2016, moving there from Seattle, Washington area. Her most recent position before joining AAU was head of school for American Academy in Prague, the first American style high school in the Czech Republic. Prior to moving to Prague, Anna served as Dean of Student Success at Bellevue College in Washington State, USA. Anna holds a master's degree in student development administration from Seattle University and a bachelor's degree in history and art from Creighton University. I will now hand it over to Anna. Hello, everybody. Good evening from Prague. I know it's daytime where you are, uh, and I'm really happy that I get to participate in this webinar today keep me connected to the states. Um, so as um, I was already introduced, you already got my um, bio. Uh, I just wanna say that in the early 2000s, I worked for the Washington Online Virtual Campus and I worked from home for four years. Um, and in, then in the context of today's webinar, I've been working from home since the Czech government shut down schools on March 11th. But even before that, all of the president's cabinet level positions at our university routinely work from home one day a week. So over the years, I've learned some things that work for me, and I'm happy to have been invited to participate today so that I can share them with you. Uh, before we get started, I want to share a quote that I saw on Twitter. I'm a really big Twitter fan. And um, the quote was, you're not just working from home, you're working from home during a pandemic. And I think that's really important for all of us to remember is that the, um, the situation that we find ourselves in um, is less than ideal. And so these are unprecedented times and normal work rules may not apply. Your results may vary. I'll just tell you what works for me. And then I'm looking forward to hearing the other presenters talk about works, what works for them. So my next slide is called Finding Your Personal Productivity Style, or your PPS. Um, and so let me just uh, give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. Uh, my husband Jody and I have been married for 23 years, and we've been living together even longer than that. So I thought that I knew what he would be like at work. Um, it must be like what he's like at home, right? Um, but when we both started working from home a few weeks ago, I started noticing some contrast in our work styles. So for example, I like to start working right after I wake up in the morning, whether it's 6.30 a.m. or 8.30 a.m., I find that I get the most done in the hours before lunch. This is my plow through the to-do list time. Uh, then once it's about 11.30 or 12, I like to take a break for lunch, maybe read for an hour, go for a short walk, sit out on the patio, or even take a nap. 
depending on my energy level that day. Um, and then from 2 to 6 p.m., I get another burst of energy, which is more creative. This is the time that I use for projects or brainstorming. In short, not having a set routine works best for me. And my boss doesn't mind when we work as long as we're getting our work done. I also work in the living room, dining room area since I have less calls than my husband does. Uh, my husband, on the other hand, he's quite regimented. He wakes up, he takes a shower, he makes coffee, he eats breakfast, then he goes into his home office. That routine does not vary. He stays there until lunch, which is usually about an hour. Then he goes back in for the afternoon and emerges about 6 p.m. He often works after I go to sleep also since night is his best work time. He's more of a night owl than I am. And I realize that we both have very different personal productivity styles. And if you think you'll be working from home regularly, you might benefit from discovering what your PPS is. So on the slide, um, I have uh, some tips from productivity pro Chris Bailey, and he calls it the natural rhythms experiment. And this worked really well for me. Maybe it might work for you as well. So he says, pick a day and start tracking how you spend your day. And there's a link in the PowerPoint to a tracker. Um, and it's just a Google Sheet. It's kind of an elaborate Google Sheet. But what it does is it gives you a way, an easy way to rate your um, uh, accomplishments once an hour. And he also suggests that you make note of any factors that could mess with your energy. So uh, maybe you didn't eat right the night before, you didn't get much sleep, um, you had a migraine. Those are all things that could uh, mess with your creativity and your productivity. So then he says, start recording what you're accomplishing once an hour. Rate your energy level, your motivation, and your focus every day. And um, this might be um, something that you do for a week, um, two weeks, three weeks. Obviously, the longer you do this, the more of an idea you'll get about your peaks and valleys. But I think even with a week, you will get a really good idea of what works best for you. And you probably know some of this yourself already. Then try switching things up. Wake up an hour earlier, meditate, exercise, do more of what works for you. And then once you figure out your PPS, rearrange your tasks and put your important high concentration tasks in periods when you're super productive and the uh, less important low concentration tasks in other periods. You may need to talk to your supervisor and your colleagues about adjusting your schedule and making sure that you have some overlap time with your colleagues. Uh, this has worked really well for me, um, knowing when I'm most productive and what kind of work I get done best at, at different times of the day. Okay, my next slide is really about working from home with a partner successfully. And I'm just gonna go through the icons sort of in a clockwise fashion. The first one I have there is household chores, things like cleaning and laundry. I like to break up my work day by maybe throwing in a load of laundry or um, you know, running a load of dishes or vacuuming a room or something like that. It gives me energy to get through the day. My husband hates it when I do that because he finds it distracting even if he's in another room. So that's something that we've had to negotiate between the two of us, when we can clean and do household chores and when we can't. Since we're together 24-7, that's been an important thing to figure out. Um, the clock, uh, when you're at work, when you're not at work. Um, I tend to be um, somebody who works all the time anyway, and I've been the point person for um, the coronavirus outbreak at our school. So um, I was answering emails at 2 o'clock in the morning and things like that, and we realized it's not productive. It's not good for our marriage <laughs> when I'm working that much. So we've had to make some arrangements about the time. Next is uh, the heart. That really represents health, exercise, but also mental health. Checking in with each other. How are you doing today? Um, I live with a pessimist. I'm a natural optimist. So I need to make sure that I'm checking in frequently with other optimists to keep my um, heart balanced as well. Next is a pair of headphones. Um, I'm easily distracted by sound, and um, so is my husband. So it's been really good for us to both have headphones, and that way he doesn't have to listen to my work calls. Next is food buying and prep. That's the taco. And uh, we've sort of uh, figured out that 
breakfast and lunch were kind of on our own. We eat when we want to eat, and then we always have dinner together. And that seems to work really well for us, but we had to negotiate that. Otherwise, I felt like it was the unspoken expectation that I would be cooking breakfast and lunch, and that didn't always work with my time schedule for work. Next is the do not disturb sign. Um, make sure that you have a signal for when you absolutely cannot be disturbed. And if you can figure that out before um, this comes up, the better, because otherwise you'll be doing that thing where you hold up one index finger and your partner might kick it the wrong way. So we just have this um, like uh, a note that we put on the door or a, a hand signal that we give each other when we absolutely cannot be disturbed. Uh, communication, communication, communication. That's the, that's the guy with the megaphone, making sure that you're talking about what's going on. Um, and maybe not when uh, the enough work talk is enough. And finally, I'm gonna leave the baby to other presenters because I don't have children and I don't have expertise in that area, but um, I'm sure that this will be covered by other people. Finally, in the last minute and a half that I have left, I wanted to talk about 10 fun ways to stay connected with your colleagues. Um, and you can see the slides here, so I'm not gonna go over all of them. Um, one thing that might be fun is to change your little avatar on Slack or Teams or Gmail. Um, it gives people something that uh, they can talk about. So, oh, you like The Simpsons? Me too. Or, oh, you used to have long hair, or, oh, you used to have hair. Um, those are all things that can kind of lighten the mood when you're um, talking about work with your colleagues. Having a virtual lunch with somebody that you would have lunch with in person is a fun way to um, break up the day. Um, snack time, what I mean by that, my husband's work does this. A um, Couple times a week, three times a week, they have the 15 minute snack at night, like at seven or eight o'clock. And um, that's when they spend 15 minutes talking about um, what was your brush with fame or what was your weirdest hobby or um, what's your favorite food? And they just talk for fun and then they um, get to know each other so much better and that seems to help them with their work and how they're working um, as, a, as a group. Um, next is be a cheerleader for someone in the organization. Maybe take a few minutes to write them a recommendation on LinkedIn or give them an email shout out. Um, it's a great way to bring attention to the work that your team members or your colleagues are doing. Um, everybody can use uh, some good news during this very bleak time. Um, and then maybe if you're doing video calls, have everyone on the team wear a funny hat or t-shirt. Uh, that can be a way also to lighten up the mood and give you um, something to discuss uh, besides work. So finally, my um, resource is there, the Productivity Project book by Chris Bailey, and then all the ways that you can get in touch with me. So I hope that um, you got something out of my presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing the other presenters. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. And now we will go on to Dr. Chris DeGeer. He is the Dean of Instruction at Jefferson College in Hillsboro, Missouri. He began his career in IT and developed a passion for teaching, eventually gaining a faculty position in the Jefferson College Computer Information Systems Department. Over his 15 years at Jeffco, he has served as classified staff, adjunct instructor, faculty, certified staff, and ultimately administrator. His background and experience equipped him to help the college transition to working remotely. I'll hand it over to you now, Chris. Thank you, Kaylin, for the introduction. Uh, I, what I would like to share with you today are some tips for really working remotely. Some of this is geared towards supervisors, but a lot of the takeaways uh, really just apply more broadly to everyone working from home. So to start, I want to think a little bit about effective communication. Uh, during these times, it's particularly important that we're empathetic with others, uh, whether it's your employees or your coworkers or the students you're working with, they're probably not used to working remotely. Um, ensure them that you can do, you'll, you're, you're gonna do everything you can to help them. A lot of times people come with concerns and if you can identify those, then you can provide guidance to them, refer them to appropriate resources and contacts, but above all, just be thinking these people are going through the similar challenges that I am and try and be empathetic. Also, it's important to be patient because there will be challenges. There have been challenges over the past couple of weeks working in this format. It's important that you're patient and kind with yourself 
as you work to adapt, as well as your employees or coworkers or students. Um, give people time to adjust, share tips you've learned. Uh, as people join a virtual meeting for the first time, give them a little while to find the mute button. I mean, we've all <laughs> been there and, and struggled and heard people having conversations in the background, and it, it just takes a little bit of time to adjust to try and be patient. It's also important to be flexible where you can. Um, some employees, uh, yourself included, may not have the technology you need. Many people have life challenges that this current pandemic just really exacerbates, like having to care for children at home and uh, trying to work in these new formats and transportation and food insecurities and all of these things tend to get exacerbated by um, crises. Also be flexible uh, with your employees and your processes. You may need to develop new processes to support your daily work. Uh, and if you can adjust schedules and due dates and be flexible with those, uh, that's really encouraged. There are some due dates we, we don't have much flexibility on, things in policies and procedures that the board requires, you know, performance evaluations by a certain date or a grant that has to have certain deadlines in. But most things uh, we have kind of the, the ability to be flexible. Also, it's important that you're honest. If you're like me, I'm sure you've been receiving lots and lots of questions. Uh, some of them you've received over and over again. Others you have no clue how to answer them, and it's perfectly okay. Uh, just assure people that you'll work to find an answer. What we did uh, at Jefferson College was compiled a frequently asked questions or Q&A document, so we don't have to answer those same questions over and over. It kind of started off in one area and then other areas of the college could see those answers and then they started adding their questions and answers and now all of our employees have access to that document to uh, find the answers they need without having to ask someone. Uh, one tool, uh, the, the next few topics really revolve around technology. Uh, we've been using Google Meet at Jefferson College for web conferencing but there are another number of other tools like Zoom out there that many people have been using. Um, just a couple quick thoughts on Google Meet specifically. Uh, you ha can use the Google Meet, uh, you see the link at the bottom uh, in your web browser to actually set up meetings and share them, but sometimes for simple meetings, it's easiest to start just by using Google Calendar, because right within Google Calendar, you can click Add Location or Conferencing to your event, and it brings up the Hangouts Meet URL and telephone call-in information. So. Um, we found that to be very useful. And then really you can just add guests like you do to any other calendar invitation. But as far as conducting and uh, participating in web conferencing, uh, we've done a whole heck of a lot of these over the last couple of weeks. And I've had some observations from uh, myself and from my coworkers. It's, so consider your background when using video. Of course, not everyone has a home office, um, but try and keep a clean background if possible. Uh, back to Anna's tips on having fun, you know, decorate it if you want. My lovely wife came in and spruced up my office, and I've got fun spring pictures behind me, and it just uh, adds, to, adds to the overall meeting. Also, it's important to model appropriate behaviors. Even though we're at home and safe and probably can touch our face without uh, actually getting infected, it still kind of makes people cringe when you see each other rubbing faces. So try not to touch your face on camera. Other habits, maybe... Um, if you are working from home, be, att be attentive to what's in the background and, uh, and in the event that, um, well, anyway, that, 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 that you've joined a meeting or hosting a meeting. This applies to both. Mute yourself when not talking. Uh, in most meetings, the host can mute any participant, but um, in some platforms like Google Meet, only the participants can unmute themselves. It's also important to speak at a normal volume. There's not really a need to shout. Some people that aren't familiar with this think they have to, to yell to be heard. Um, headsets are also helpful in some cases if you don't have a good microphone on your computer or phone. Uh, with Google Meet, you may have to tell your call-in participants how to mute or unmute their voice and be patient with them. It takes time to adjust. One other hot tip is uh, let attendees know if you're recording so they can avoid disparaging their supervisors. <laughs> Another tool that we've used to uh, host meetings is, uh, or to, to take minutes for meetings is Google Docs. Um, there are a number of platforms for this, but one thing that's nice about Google Docs is that multiple people can access it and work on it at the same time. 
You can streamline your minute taking to save your um, secretaries on committees or, or departmental meetings time and effort. We use a shared Google Drive folder and put Google Docs in there for the leader of the meeting and the secretary to work together on minutes. You could also consider using a single meeting document. We used to have a word agenda that we handed out and then we would take minutes into a minutes template. But with this uh, process, we've just started using one meeting document that is the agenda and then we take the notes right into it live during the meeting. After you review them, the secretary can then just send that same document out to people. Um, we have had a lot of urgent meetings with this coronavirus preparation that required immediate communication. So for those types of meetings, we actually appointed a second secretary so that they both are working together on the minutes and can check each other's work. And generally we've had the turnaround of those minutes uh, being cleaned up and ready for distribution within 30 minutes to an hour after the meeting's over. So that's been very helpful. And one other tech tool we're using is Trello. If you're unfamiliar with Trello, it is a task management system that allows you to create boards. On those boards, you can build lists. Uh, the way we've chosen to implement it is to hold different statuses in those lists. So we have lists for those tasks that are ready to do, those that are in process or waiting on someone to, to, to provide something, the ones that are needing review, and then things that are just finished. And then on each of those lists, we can create cards for each task that needs to be done. And then members of the board can assign themselves to tasks and move them to different lists as they work on them. Kind of broad strokes, but what we've done with that is use this to identify tasks that individuals uh, may be able to do if, if working from home doesn't allow them to uh, participate in work the way they normally do, if they can't contribute uh, their skills in, in a maximum way. So maybe, for example, you have a custodian uh, who could certainly help call students to make sure that they're doing okay these days, even though they can't be cleaning facilities. So as we're thinking about uh, keeping people productive and managing workloads, this Trello tool is coming to be uh, pretty instrumental. So some things we're looking at for Trello uh, sign up are student call-a-thons, uh, curriculum document management. We have syllabi that need updates with certain statements, or we have uh, academic maps that need new um, people's names on them, things like that. Taking minutes for a committee, maybe your, your current committee secretary is out and you need someone to do that. And really uh, anything people can do with, with little to no training. Uh, another area that's just popped up since, this la since I put this slide together yesterday is our proctoring department. As we have more remote users and more students working remotely, we aren't able to uh, really proctor all of those exams with our existing staff. So we're going to allow folks to sign up, get some very basic training to monitor suspicious activities during the proctoring session and um, participate in that effort. So Jefferson College, uh, th this and some of the other initiatives like the Google Docs weren't a top-down thing either. You may have people at your institution that are very tech savvy. In these cases, our senior administrative uh, senior administrative support person at the college is great with technology. She's helped to coordinate all of this and then worked with others through our employee support committee and with other administrative assistants so that they all are working through the same processes and sharing. Um, she also put together this great Trello tutorial and quick guide for task delegation. These are a little bit uh, in depth and contain a lot of information about how to make it work technically. But from an end user standpoint, all they really have to do is open the board click on a task that they're willing to work on and click join. And now the person organizing that task says, oh good, I've got somebody else who can help with X, or Y, or Z. Um, so those are some tech tools that hopefully will help you and some tips for effective communication. Uh, and I certainly hope it was useful. Thank you, Chris. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I, I did forget to mention at the beginning that if you um, have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of the session. So our next presenter is Laura Romero and she's an account executive in Salesforce's higher education division. She has spent the last decade in the higher education technology space, establishing partnerships with institutions to address affordability, employability, and retention. She has worked with both four-year and two-year institutions across the entire country. 
During this time, Laura has maintained her office in the home and has learned a lot from that experience. She is a graduate graduate of Texas Tech University and lives in Lubbock, Texas with her husband and two daughters, six and three. I'll hand it over to you now, Laura. Thank you so much. I am very excited to be here and thank you Anna and Chris, um, as you heard my bio, I've worked at home for 10 years and I'm already walking away with lots of notes and things that I'm going to implement in my daily life. So um, very exciting to hear all of that. Um, so I wanted to start by um, kind of telling you guys a, maybe a little bit of a personal story and I'm pulling the, the curtains back a little bit. So hopefully I don't um, embarrass myself too much. Um, but again, I've worked from home for 10 years. So because my primary office is in the home, it has been a priority for me to have an office space um, in our house. And I understand that that is not going to be a reality for the vast majority of you all and all individuals that are now um, working from home. So, you know, when we think about this expectation of having a home office, you've got this beautiful room and it's, it's well lit and it's got all of the resources that you need. And that was a reality for me for a while. Um, but I share this story with you all to kind of show you that where there's a will, there's a way. So where we are at right now, we have uh, moved into a new home and we are remodeling our house. And when I say remodeling, we're not just painting. We completely gutted the entire thing. Um, which when we planned this, we thought, okay, this is fine. It's in the middle of the spring semester, which is usually a, a travel heavy time for me. I'm on the road, I'm spending time on campus. So we thought, no big deal, we can survive this. Well, thank you, COVID-19, that isn't quite the case. So <laughs> I am now living and working from a complete disaster. Um, so this is my office currently. Um, so I have a plastic fold-out table that I'm pretty sure was purchased and used for garage sale purposes. I have all of my office equipment and my office chair set up, but I have a lovely shade of primer walls, uh, concrete floor. It is freezing cold and it echoes terribly, but um, it was very important to me to have a specific office space. So as ugly and weird as it is, uh, this has been the most important thing that, um, that I've done so far. So I want to start off by talking about setting up your workspace and designating a specific area to be your workspace is hands down the most important thing I think that you can do when working from home. Um, and it was actually very interesting because yesterday I attended one of my companies, uh, we call them Be Well webinars. And one of our guest speakers was Trevor Noah, who is the host of the Daily Show. He's an author and a comedian. And this was actually his number one piece of advice as well. Uh, you know, we got to speak to him a lot about how he's now operating a production, uh, you know, from his home office and collaborating with his um, colleagues on that. So really just validated this for me. So if you take nothing away, at least for my portion of this, um, I would say this is the most important piece. So I know it is very tempting to do these things from your couch or bed, um, but do not do that. Um, when you wake up in the morning, you know, it's easy to grab your laptop and just sit there, you know, propped up on your pillow with a cup of coffee. But it's really important to have a separate place where you can actually physically go to work. Don't take work to a, you know, relaxing area. Do it in a space where you can actually get up and, and go to that um, particular area of your home. If that needs to be in a common area, uh, which I think it certainly will be for most, you know, it might be, uh, you know, the very end of your dining table or maybe just in the corner of a living room. Um, if it does need to be in a common area, you can always pick a space that then can be cleaned up um, on the weekend. So if you can set your computer things out, say on the dining room table, but you want to really separate that work time from home time, do an area where it's easy to clean that up. So then whenever it is the weekend, you feel like you're in your home and you're not in your office. I would also advise you to use your network to borrow items. Um, as you saw in my picture, I'm using a plastic a garage sale table. You know, I guarantee you your great aunt has a card table that she uses for Bridger Bunko that 
isn't getting used right now unless she's, you know, playing solitaire by herself. So, you know, reach out to your friends and family and even coworkers to say, hey, I'm in need of just a, a pop-out table to put in the corner of my living room. Um, you know, is that, does anyone have any that I can borrow? Um, my sister-in-law even uh, stole her 10 year old desk from her room. She said, you know, she can work in the living room, but I need to have my space and I don't have a desk in my bedroom. So she took that desk out of her daughter's room and now has that set up in her bedroom. So uh, don't blame me when your children get angry, but I'm telling you it is, uh, it is well worth the sacrifice for them. Another important piece is going to be setting up your equipment. I think this is a little bit harder, especially where there may be expenses involved, but again, uh, reach out to your, your friends, family, and even coworkers to see what um, things they might have that you can utilize. Um, one thing that's always been an absolute must for me is an external monitor. So I use a laptop <clears throat> and then just via an HDMI cable, I hook up to an external monitor. So that is something that I purchased, but you can always use, uh, you know, an old monitor for a computer that doesn't work anymore. I did that for a while. You know, once the computer portion stops working, you know, the monitor is typically still uh, functioning. Um, so you can use that. I've even used an old TV before, just via an HDMI cable, you can hook up to a TV. I feel like I'm a little bit more productive when I have more than just that 13 inch screen on my laptop. So definitely look into that, um, as well as a mouse and keyboard. Um, at least for me, maybe because I'm getting old, my hand starts to hurt after a little while from using the trackpad. Uh, you can get a mouse um, that's Bluetooth for around $15 on Amazon, as well as a keyboard. And then um, my co-presenters have already alluded to the earphones. I think those are, you know, an absolute must as well. I don't have noise canceling ones, but now I think I might actually invest in those after hearing uh, some of the others speak to that. Um, and then lastly, your environment is really going to affect your mindset. And so that's kind of been one of my, you know, big um, priorities throughout this is if I'm flustered, if I'm stressed, I'm not going to be productive. So if I'm not going to focus on making my environment so that I can focus and I can do these things, there's no point in me even getting up and going to work in the morning because I'm not going to be able to do anything um, if I can't truly focus um, and prioritize my time. So next we'll talk about creating that work-life work balance when you live where you work. Um, so I think establishing a schedule and keeping that um, as a routine will be really helpful. So physically getting up and getting ready for work. So whatever that means to you. Uh, last week for me, a couple of days, that meant I put on a business casual top for my video calls, but I wore pajama pants. So I've kind of got that, uh, you know, business on top, party on bottom. Uh, but that made me feel comfortable, but still allowed me to put on my makeup, brush my hair, do those things I traditionally do when I'm going to work. Um, and have that process of going to work so you are separating that time from, hey, I'm, you know, getting up and I'm actually physically going, rather than rolling over when you wait, when your alarm goes off, grabbing your laptop and starting to work from there. Um, I found very early on that I was starting to do that early in the morning and it would get to noon and I hadn't eaten, I hadn't brushed my teeth and I, you know, was cranky and not being productive. So really kind of schedule your time so you have that, that time for yourself in the morning. <clears throat> and then limit distractions. So balancing your schedule with work tasks and house tasks. And this is something I really struggled with at the very beginning when I started working from home because it was hard for me to, you know, be in my office working when all I could think about was, okay, I've got 36 loads of laundry that need to be done. The dishes from last night are still in the sink. Um, I need to prepare dinner for this evening. Um, so a few things I had to do was one, a lot of, let a lot of that go, um, which I know is easier said than done, but you really do have to be able to do that and separate yourself from those, um, from those tasks and take the extra effort in the evening to complete those things. And that's something that I had to be very honest with my husband about is letting him know, these are things I need to do um, to help me relieve my stress during the day where he's kind of the opposite. You know, he wants to relax in the evenings and let's do it tomorrow. So we've just had to have a lot of conversations about our own um, personality traits and you know, managing what each of us needs to do to not feel stressed. Um, Netflix and chill, it's not Netflix and work, I won't belabor that point, um, but you cannot 
work, be productive while you are also watching Netflix. Um, your, that said, though, your brain can do two things at once if one is a habit. Um, so when I do have those kind of house tasks that pile up, I will do those things like a load of laundry or dishes. When I'm on a call with, say, my manager that doesn't require I'm sitting at my computer, we're just catching up. Maybe I'm asking for help on some things or I'm talking to a colleague about a new idea or a new project that I'm struggling with. Those are things I can easily do while I'm doing housework. And then set expectations and boundaries with your new coworkers. So whether that's children or husband, um, let them know each morning, you know, what is, what is your day going to look like and what are those boundaries need to be? Um, I think it was uh, Anna that mentioned earlier, you know, having a signal for when you can't be interrupted. Those things will be really helpful. And just setting that expectation with everyone in the home so everyone kind of knows going into the day what they can be um, expecting. So next, working from home with kids. Y'all, there's no other way around it. It's hard. I don't know if you are familiar with BBC Dad. This is one of my favorite things ever. This has actually happened to me with my daughter in a grass skirt with a tambourine that uh, joined me for a client call one day when she had the flu. Um, so it happens and it's hard, but there are some ways that we can help, um, that we can help manage this. So, you know, kids are really curious. I know mine are, as you heard, mine are six and three. Um, so they're really intrigued with what it, what is your job and, you know, really wrapping their heads around it. It's not, you know, something like, oh, you're a, a police officer or a teacher. My job is very hard for them to grasp. So I try to involve them in low stakes tasks. So for example, when preparing this slide deck, they picked out the, the backdrop or the, um, the template, if you will. So picking little things that they can do with you um, I don't know if you can see in this image, but this was my team call last Friday. Uh, the first 10 minutes, um, we let all of our kids join, and uh, my manager, Brian, his son got to pick, you know, what the agenda was, and he said, you know, I want to hear some good jokes. So everyone's kid got on, and we told jokes, and that kind of, you know, set them at bay to where they then lost interest and, you know, walked away, and we were able to complete that business portion. Um, or give them a job. I've allowed my daughter to join um, calls when, uh, you know, again, it's low stakes. And I told my daughter, hey, you can take notes. I really need a note taker. If you can jot down things that you think are important. Um, and that really helped her. And again, usually after a few minutes, she loses interest and moves on. Um, one thing that I started doing, uh, I think maybe two years ago when uh, one of my daughters was home with the flu, was really working to prepare kids for when you can't be interrupted. Um, so this is a, a great example of something I did today, right before we started this webinar, is I spent 15 minutes with my daughter beforehand and gave her that 15 minutes of undivided attention. I set the expectation up front of we're going to spend some great time together, but then I'm going to have a phone call uh, and I can't, I can't be interrupted. And during that 15 minutes, I let her pick, how did we want to spend that time? Um, so they get that interaction that they crave from you. So they really then can, you know, go do um, their own thing or be, uh, you have that alone time when you're doing those important things. Um, as far as homeschooling goes, we are just in kindergarten. So I, I apologize, I don't have great tips for you with older children. I think that it might be a little bit easier when they can read. I think that's what we're struggling with now is I can't give my daughter a list of tasks, which does make that hard. Um, but really focusing on scheduling and prioritizing. I was very overwhelmed when I got the list from the school of everything that we needed to do, but I am taking the path of doing what I can and looking at what my daughter needs to do, you know, what skill sets is she struggling with, and really focusing on those. Um, so she's really great at reading, so we're not going to spend as much time on reading as we are in math, because that's something she needs to focus on. Um, and lastly, remember, there is a reason we don't do this regularly. It is not humanly impossible. So in closing, I will say, give yourself grace. This is something I'm trying to remind myself of pretty much every minute of every day. It's not going to be perfect. Not everything's gonna get done. Tensions are gonna be high. Your health will be a mess. If it's not, please call and give me some tips. And your kids will eat all the snacks. Like it is just bananas how many snacks we are going through, but I am just accepting it. This too shall pass painfully like a kidney stone, but remember it will pass. So do your best, 
and be kind to yourself and we will survive this together one way or another. All right, so I'll pass it back to you, Kaylin. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much. I don't know about you guys, but these are great tips and Bobby and I are taking notes like crazy. Um, we will move on now to Ambrosia. Ambrosia Harrison is the Skill Up Project Support Specialist for St. Louis Community College Workforce Solutions Group. Her position was working closely with the State of Missouri's Department of Social Services Family Support Division to support the Skill Up program and help provide tuition assistance for in-demand job field training to Missouri residents that are receiving food stamps. She is a graduate of Ledoux Horton Watkins High School and attended St. Louis Community College Merrimack in the field of architectural technology. She has worked for St. Louis Community College for three years and has a background in drafting, construction, office administration, and a passion for social justice and care for the needy and less fortunate. She and her husband have two children, ages two and three, wow, your hands are full, who keep them busy and active. Ambrosia, you've got the floor. Hello, everyone. So speaking of busy and active, we do also have a dog and a cat. And between the two of them, they have added a little bit extra stress into the situation of always being at home. Um, I am a very busy person nonetheless. And so it is, it is different and difficult to accommodate. So this will be just mainly working on accommodating to your new, um, new surroundings and the new situation. So Okay, correct. So childcare and school closure um, closures are a huge part of why so many parents are more or less forced to um, come to terms and come to grips with everything that's been changing. So within the Scale Up program at St. Louis Community College, um, the, the program that I work with assists in more than just the supportive services for training and workforce development. I also assist with verification sent to Family Support Division directly so that individuals can maintain their food stamps, but also child care subsidies to assist participants while they're in training, especially during this pandemic. So it is a huge change for a lot of them because they are used to, whether they have a car or using regular um, bus transportation, they are used to actually being um, able to drop their children off and go into a medical assistant training and be there for X amount of hours and have their children be picked up and watched until their training is over. So that, that has been a huge thing that I've noticed. It's very, very difficult for them. Um, for us, we in particular use an in-home daycare that is in our subdivision. It's really close, homey, comfortable, but she is um, older and she has a mother who is older as well and lives in a retirement home. And so she would be potentially putting her family at risk. So when she closed two Fridays ago, I was already working at home. So I was able to, to really go through and um, decide what I was going to do to make it best work for, for our family. So new technology has spurned childhood into a virtual reality where the opportunity to grow and learn is almost infinite. They have opportunities to do um, really visual everything, like or, or virtual everything. You can uh, visit stars through NASA. You can do so many different things. The San Diego Zoo now is giving virtual tours. It's great. It's educational. But is it the schoolwork that your children are being given? So I really think that once we are able to put our children in school, um, even if something were to happen similar to this in the future, uh, we would have to consider creating a schedule that is broken up into segments to reduce burnout and the monotony that they're not used to. They're not used to sitting down for you know, four hours straight to do the work that is given to them to do within eight hours. So we shouldn't be trying to force them into that either. So with that monotony, you break it up into sections and you get an idea of how you would feel if you were put in that situation and were missing your friends. So while they're working on their tablets and computers, you can come up with uh, schedules and guidelines. And I'll have on the next slide a list of very vague things that are both scheduled and guidelines to kind of lead the day by. Um, when I say color and light, I mean open the windows, even if it's cold outside, you know, let the natural light in. 
because it can change the way that a child is feeling. Um, also, just make a, a standard when they're going to bed, helping them understand what their tasks are for the next day. Um, snacks and lunch at a regular time. For my children, that also means taking a nap at a regular time, which is in about a half hour. So we'll see about that. Um, and then play. So if, even if they're high schoolers, they want to play. They can't necessarily play with their friends close by, but they can, you know, <laughs> yes, yay for naps. Um, they can take the opportunity to play video games if that's an option or something that is allowable within your home. For younger children, they do need some sort of differing attention. Video games don't always work. They may be too young to understand. My kids are two and three, and they already know how to get into my iPhone and my iPad, and I don't know how they know these things. Their faces aren't set up for it, but they get in. I guess they know the codes. It, they are very smart, very astute. They watch and they learn. So we do also have to be gracious around them because even though we're working, we don't want to be uh, grumpy mommy or grumpy daddy just because we're working and they are around us. Um, so again, sticking with the schedule and those guidelines, um, and I'll kind of go into that on the next slide. Touch and sensory are huge for young children. And when I say young, I mean really 10 and younger. Um, you can kind of determine if your child has a touch or sensory issue early on. Either they have like no boundaries or they um, do not enjoy loud music or loud sounds or don't like, you know, the, the line on their socks, things like that. I have one child that is highly sensory and the other one who could basically just wear anything and doesn't care. So between the two of them, approaches to things are very different. So within the time that I knew that they would eventually end up at home with me, I went out to like Dollar Tree because Michaels and Hobby Lobby are way too expensive uh, for them to just basically chew on everything. I bought a bunch of acrylic paints and wood projects and uh, different things that were touch and even water beads, put them in a big old bucket, poured the water in and let them see the science experiment that is watching water beads grow to like six times their size. So they love it because you can also dip your hands into it and it is a phenomenal feeling, <laughs> unless you don't like, you know, that type of sensory. So again, with color and light, they are able to open up all of their, the windows in the house. Our house um, front door is west facing. Yeah, so we have a lot of sunlight and our dog, um, a lot of sunlight without having the actual sun in the house. So um, engaged conversation. Whenever they ask a question, try not to shoo them off unless you are doing something important. Um, and then play with them, whether that's playing with their food, asking them if they like it, if they can help you, or playing with Play-Doh and uh, kinetic sand, things like that, that really help a child um, have you around without feeling like they are talking to a brick wall because you're on the phone or you're working on a project. So examples such as these ensure that parents and children alike are flexible with one another. So the very first line on, on this states before 9 a.m. That may mean that mommy and daddy are up at six and getting things done, ready, prepared for the kid to wake up kind of whenever they want. Um, and it gives like very blanketed lists and ideas of what you can do within that time, chore time, um, creative time, outside, lunch, um, and then, you know, nap time kind of in between there, outside again, free play, and supper with reading, bath time, shower. It all depends. My little ones do not stick with any type of uh, schedule except that bedtime is at 9.30. So this is quite off. I did not write this. I found it on a Facebook group called uh, Kids Quarantine Resources. And uh, it just kind of reminds you every day that Children are all very, very different. Um, and so these daily quarantine questions are really great for my entire family. So it says, what am I grateful for today? And these can be things that you discuss in the morning and then again in the evening. So whether that was, I planted flowers in the garden, things like that. And it is wonderful uh, to see what their answers are. It says, who am I checking in with or connecting with today? So is that grandparents that they missed that have, they haven't seen in two weeks? 
what expectations of normal am I letting go of today? We do have to be able to live a little bit outside of the box when it comes to um, the changes that we're going through. And how am I getting outside today? How am I moving my body today? For me in particular, we will wake up. When I first wake up, I um, do a little bit of bar. It's gentle on my knees. I've got like uh, exercise induced arthritis in my knees. I can tell when it's going to rain. So I have to stretch just to feel alive. Otherwise, it's just not a good day for me. So my little ones enjoy bar because it also includes music. So it's like a bar fusion. Easy to do, but get your heart rate up. And we have a decent sized backyard. So we hang out out there, sometimes eat breakfast, and then come inside and do a few uh, collective activities. And then what beauty am I creating today? Cultivating or inviting in? So it's, it's wonderful to see what little kids find beautiful because although they are stuck at home with us parents, they are willing to say, mommy did her hair nicely. She let me do this. We took pictures. And they are things that we may take for granted as adults, but for them, it is technically taking on memory. So we want to not let that go to the wayside and spend as much time um, with and around them as possible without it necessarily interfering with our work. So this um, slide is specifically for individuals who have um, needs that would comply with ADA within their uh, human resources department at work. So, you know, your ADA needs may be met in your office, Oops. may be met in your office, but you may need to make changes in your at-home office and situation to make yourself comfortable at home as well. If you can't sit for too long, you can't stand for too long, you can't kneel for too long, you, you need to find a comfortable situation. So while continuing on a schedule that will make your home as comfortable to work in as your office, it also helps ensure that you're making the most of your space for efficiency. You don't want to be uncomfortable and then have to go take a nap because you're drained physically. You want to be as comfortable as possible while also dressing the part, which is the next little bit that we'll go through. Um, and Laura and Anna both covered those perfectly. Um, so there's not much that I really have in there um, that is really any different. Just a few examples of situational comfort, um, modifying the layout of your workspace. So if you had a sit and stand desk at work, maybe have a setup where you can use a kitchen countertop sitting on top of something so that that is the standing and use your kitchen, I'm sorry, your dining room table for the, sit, or for the standing, uh, for the sitting, sorry. Um, basically, if you're comfortable standing for a short period of time, comfortable sitting for a short period of time, you want to be able to ensure that you can do both. Um, also ensure that your office is close to a restroom and that that restroom isn't going to be too hard to get to or, you know, in terms of little people trying to use the potty somewhere else <laughs> is a little bit hard. Um, I, too, am, like Laura, going through a little bit of a remodel. Not our entire house, but we are putting a second bathroom in our basement. So everything is really dusty, and um, we have a tub in our bathroom that, or in our basement that now holds water. So making sure that you know, the, the fixtures are safe for the children to be walking around. And then like with today, I let them know outright what was going on. I packed up a box for them. They love boxes. They're like little cats, um, like hoarding little cats. Uh, <laughs> they got the little box. They got a few sensory things, a few water beads, colored pencils, markers, crayons, everything that they could ever dream of. They are watching Boss Baby down t uh, downstairs, and they are happy because they know where I am, I know where they are, and if they need to use the restroom, it's right upstairs. They don't have any issues with that. Um, so then adjusting your work schedule so that if you do have um, an employee with a, uh, or if you are an employee with a chronic medical condition, you can go to medical appointments and complete your work at alternate times. So those are things that you would want to have that open communication um, with, as Chris had mentioned, just stating and showing how you are being flexible and then how flexible your company is as well. So we want to be as open about what we're doing and how we're doing it. And really, as long as we're getting our work done, that is a huge part of, of what's going on with us working from home. 
So again, like Laura said, you know, dressing the part, <laughs> do you wear pajamas to the office? I'd hope not. Um, I mean, it's not middle school or high school where they have like a pajama spirit day. <laughs> I don't think that that's a thing. Um, so you should do your best to dress um, the way that you would even for a business casual day. And it can help spark a new part of the day, um, basically a work day where you realize, yes, I am going to work. Yes, I do have young children around me. And for them, um, I make my little ones get out of their uh, basically comfort clothes, their sleep clothes, pajamas, whatever they slept in that night. And I make them change into different clothes. And that signals, hey, we're switching into a different gear. And that helps them both wake up and be more active. It also usually leads to them wanting a snack and then being like, hey, when's breakfast? What would you like for breakfast? And being able to work with them with that as well. We do have to remember that working from home could be due to more than just the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I personally live about a half a mile south of St. Louis Airport, uh, Lambert Airport, and so I am in a very high traffic area. When I leave home, the things that I encounter if I leave home are very different than what they were a month ago. And so we have to remember that while things are different now, a blizzard, excessive heat, and even a power outage, such as what's going on in uh, Georgia, can make this pandemic even worse, or it could cause its own issues that forces us to be at home instead of in our offices. So I love this image. It kind of reflects how, um, how we feel as little kids, um, but also as adults. So if we are stressed out, we can only imagine what we are portraying back to our children. Um, it says, did you know shelter at home can change behavior, ch or can create behavior changes? And that's for both the parents and the children. You might notice changes in sleeping and eating habits. Um, your child might be clinging and seeking connection with you, which may cause problems if you have things like video chat or phone conferences to be a part of. Impulse control isn't easy when the brain is full of worry. Be kind, be patient, take a break. Your child needs love and support, not perfect schedules or perfect parenting. And I recently saw a quote, I think on BuzzFeed, it said, there's a difference between homeschooling and crisis schooling. We know that this is not the way that it is normally. The children also know they, they aren't, uh, you know, that's that idea. They know that they're not seeing their friends right now. They're not allowed to really leave the house. Um, and some parents are more strict. Some parents are more lenient. Just depending on what's allowable in that area or in that state, it can kind of change and vary. So we just have to remember that we do have to have boundaries and expectations, but that we do have to be flexible at the same time. Um, and the, the biggest thing that I've found, um, I'm, I'm not as big into Twitter, but I found a few uh, pieces of medical advice that I won't be following. And one of them is the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines on screen time. That's kind of gone out the window for me. So depending on how strict you are with that, that may have also gone out the window for you as well. And also depending on the age of your children. So that is just kind of my general overview on working from home, making sure that uh, you're comfortable and that your children are able to be cared for while you are also working. Kayla? Thanks so, thanks so much, Ambrosia. Great, great tips. Um, we do have a couple questions for you guys. Um, first, I want to say, yes, the slides will be available on our website and um, the presentation today and the contact information for the presenters as well. And you will also be emailed the presentation um, via email, obviously, uh, after Bobby gets it uploaded and all that good stuff. Um, so I do have a couple questions. And the one comment is, I like the idea of the snack time, and now they have a fun topic at each. I'm going to incorporate this into my group FaceTimes and happy hours and with kids at dinner. Um, one thing is uh, another comment, love the idea of finding PPS. I'll have to do this for my kids to make sure they're successful at home. Um, and can anyone speak to tips to those used to working in a team collaborative office but are now working from home and live alone? 
and any presenter that wants to chime in, please do so. I can speak a little, a uh, little bit to that from, you know, when I first started working from home. And I think the thing I struggled with with being at home and I, what I could imagine would be hard now is it kind of feels like, especially if you are, you know, alone, like it just feels like the whole day is like never ending. Like you're, there's really no separation between work time and home time. I mean, I would, you know, get up and work and then I think, well, you know, I don't, I don't have anyone else to <laughs> share my time with this evening. So maybe I'll, I'll take a break in the middle of the day and then I'll come back to work in the evenings. And so I found myself doing that a lot. Um, but I think like the biggest thing was really, again, sticking to, um, to that routine of these are my work hours and these are my hours. So, you know, sticking to that. And, you know, I, again, I do think it is, is hard in this circumstance, um, but just, you know, doing what a lot of people are doing, you know, trying to FaceTime and, you know, Zoom with your friends as many, as, you know, as often as you can, you know, we're doing that with kind of our parent group and our church small group. We're just doing everything um, in Zoom. Um, but I think, uh, Anna, did you have something to add to that as well? Yeah, I was going to suggest um, something that a Twitter friend of mine did. She just put it out there to her Twitter community and maybe Facebook or whatever platform you're on um, that what you need. And she just said, you know, I live alone and I don't have um, very many friends here. She lives in Berlin. Um, she's a recent expat and uh, I need to somebody to talk to. And so we started talking a couple times a week for 15 minutes on WhatsApp. So it's free and it just gives her somebody to talk to. And I think this is a time um, when all of us are feeling um, kind of separated from our regular lives. So I think asking for what you want and what you need is uh, something that we all have to do for ourselves. I do have one quick comment on that as well. We work in a very collaborative office, uh, so, so I can understand the challenges when you're separated from your coworkers where you're constantly bouncing ideas and sharing stories. Uh, one thing that I have noticed is that the more we've used these technology tools like virtual meetings, uh, shared uh, file workspaces, um, the Trello board, but especially the meetings, <clears throat> is that uh, it, it starts to become more normal and it extends into other areas as well. So you don't just have to use these tools for uh, official meetings. I mean, I told one of my assist, uh, coworkers the other day, so that, you know, if you wanna just see Tina's face, why don't you just give her a call up with Google Meet and just reminding people that it's okay to, to connect using these tools, even if it isn't specifically for work. Those are great tips. Um, we have another question. This one is for Laura. A week ago, I didn't think I'd say this, but I'm starting to really like working from home. What tips do you have for talking with my supervisor about working from home after the pandemic? If this is Bobby, the answer is no. I'm just joking, Laura. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, you know, I will say that I have been fortunate that, that my role has always been remote. I've never had to have that you know, discussion, because that was kind of, has always been, you know, the expectation. I live in Lubbock, so middle of nowhere, so, you know, not really a thriving metropolis where I'm going to have, like, an office that I can, uh, that I can actually go to, but um, as far as having that type of conversation with your, um, with your manager, I think that's, you know, that's acceptable, but I would go into that conversation, maybe with some data, uh, to show how your productivity has increased. So if you're not tracking that already, that's something I would try to start to quantify if you can, um, because, you know, I worked in an office before, and so it was a big transition for me because you have to be very disciplined to be able to work from home. Uh, kind of going back to some of those things I mentioned where, you know, it can be hard when you've got other things in your house that are weighing on your shoulders and really being able to separate that. So I think it's going to be important to showcase to your manager that you can that you can do that. Um, that's not for everyone. If you feel like you can do that well, I think that's great. So I would definitely showcase your ability to do that. And then again, showcasing if you can data around productivity, because I know when I was in the office, like people would come and talk to me 
constantly. Like I had one guy that would just like, you know, get his Cheetos and come stand in my doorway. And at one point I would like have to hide from him when I knew it was going to be his break because I had things that I needed to get done, but also didn't want to be rude to my employees. So um, I do think that that aspect is, is nice because you can kind of cut out some of that, uh, you know, unnecessary communication and really focus on what needs to get done. So Yes, that would be my recommendation is, you know, just having some quantifiable data to showcase with them so they really can make that evaluation um, adequately. Anna, go ahead if um, you wanted to add. Yeah, I was just going to say um, what I had to do in this current position is um, ask for a trial run um, and uh, say, could I do this for three months? This is what I propose, working from home every Wednesday. These are the things that I'm going to work on um, and make an agreement with my supervisor that we would check in after three months and see if it was working and that if I could extend it. And um, that worked out really well because then he could see um, that I was achieving results and um, that I was very responsive via email and chat. And so they could get a hold of me whenever they needed to. And my team is fine with it too. And so I, I think that might be a, a way to dip your toe in the water without your boss having to make a really long-term commitment. Um, and then also see if there's any rules about it in your, from your HR department. For us at our university, it's one of our, uh, the benefits that we have, but some places definitely frown upon it and it could be looked on as favoritism. So you definitely don't wanna rock the boat but I think a trial run is a really great way to sort of prove um, that you're trustworthy and that you can do this. Yeah, and I would recommend too, I think that that's a really great point. And um, I'm always super cautious of things like this. I would make sure whether it come directly from your manager or from your HR department, depending on what makes the most sense for your organization. But getting that in writing, I have seen coworkers where they've made verbal agreements with a member of the leadership staff, and then that leadership has, you know, for some reason, you know, changed. And then the new person comes in and is like, yeah, no, I'm not okay with this. So, you know, making sure that you you have a mutual success plan in place of these are what the parameters are, you know, this is how I'm going to basically earn this and having that in writing. So if anything changes, uh, you've got your back covered. That's a great, great point. Um, and now we, we do have a comment uh, regarding one of the other questions. It, she said, I work in student affairs and we have been Zoom meetings and trainings which, which help us keep connected. So yeah, and that's a follow up to that question. Uh, one other question we have is how do you remain self-disciplined and self-motivated? So for me, it's all about my schedule. Were you adding Chris? Well, yeah. it is a lot of schedule. Yeah, I would So I, what I was going to say is, yes, schedules are certainly important. Um, I, I generally, even when I'm working in the office, have my day scheduled out pretty uh, from start to finish, just with different meetings and work. But uh, other things is if you do use Google, there are ways that you can add tasks that you can check off if they're done. Also, we haven't really discussed strengths in this session, but if you're familiar with what your strengths are, you can find uh, ways that you can kind of work within them. One, one of mine particularly uh, lends me to creating lists and I really enjoy checking things off. So back to that whole point of just scheduling things and um, staying on those tasks. Um, the other thing is really that whole separation between uh, relaxing time and work time that we talked about a little earlier. I think if, if you do put on some different clothes and, and get to your workspace, then you kind of automatically are entering productivity time uh, and that can help as well. Laura, did you have something you'd like to add as well? No, that was pretty much exactly what I was going to say. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Yes. <laughs> so we can move on to the next question. Um, any website or resources that um, any of you use, um, like especially in the area of well-being or yoga or meditation? 
I am a big fan of therapy. I think mental health is probably one of the most important things for our, our own well-being. Um, so I have a therapist that I visit with uh, usually once a month, depending on the circumstance. Right now, I've asked her to move in with me. Apparently, there was an issue with boundaries with that. So she was like, yeah, no. Um, but I do rely on her. We're do, you know, I do video meetings with her. Um, you know, your insurance provider may have um, – I know, I know ours has some, you know, kind of online chat features where you can, you know, speak with someone and just having kind of like that outside perspective, you know, because I can share with my husband, like, hey, these are things that I'm stressed about or these are issues that I have. But it, what's really helped me is having someone that's completely outside of the situation to be able to reflect on that. And you get the, well, Laura, how does that make you feel? <laughs> you know, those, uh, you know, types of questions. But that for me has been something that's been, um, you know, really helpful for me, you know, for a number of years, you know, not just now, but now it's been, um, you know, I think even more important than in the past. So I encourage you to, you know, maybe look into your insurance um, to see what kind of resources they have as far as mental health support is concerned. Yes, and I'd, I'd definitely uh, second that as well. Um, I actually see a therapist once a week, and since their clinic is now closed for one-on-one -on -one, um, appointments, we are doing Zoom meetings um, in the evening when it works for her, and, you know, it really does take a huge load off. Um, I also see a psychiatrist, among other things, and recently he asked me, you know, how are things going? How are you feeling? And my response was, well, you know, really, to, to put it quite honestly, this is the best time to be on the medications that you prescribed to me. And he laughed, but it was, it was very true because um, so true. I deal with, you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, I deal with different things such as uh, PTSD and anxiety. And um, I also have attention um, deficit disorder, which is just a strain of ADHD. I am both hyperactive, but I have bouts of inattentiveness. So um, my medications work to really keep me going, and I know that if I don't take them, it will be just a, a crapshoot of a day. It won't even be worth really getting out of bed. But for all of the anxiety that has been going on around this uh, coronavirus and who have you been in contact with, um, are you staying in contact with family, things like that, um, I just have a, a not just mental checklist of things that I want to do, but things that I will accomplish um, when I am not working so that those things aren't weighing on me while I am working. And that way that there is a, a separation because we honestly need to have that or else we will, we will lose our sanity and we don't want that to happen um, because then the workforce that's already really, really drained will be down another person. And so um, there, are, there are certain things that, that uh, do weigh on my mind on a regular basis, but they are things that are really unavoidable. And so I do have a few like uh, fun uh, affirmations that I found online on Amazon. And I do bar fitness from home since uh, the bar class that I was in was canceled due to this. And she just opened up a Facebook page and does the same workouts that we were doing in class, um, but she does them online with the music and everything. And it's great. Get your heart pumping. And it's an hour long from the comfort of your home, you know, and it, you know, you can stop it if your kids run in or if your dog runs in. But really staying physically active and mentally active has been a huge help. I would also say just do something that you like. You know, we're so caught up in doing all these things that we have to do that we might forget about the things that we enjoy, like gardening or playing music or even uh, video games or going for a walk. Uh, I think those are all particularly helpful for keeping your, yourself sane. And then uh, one, one resource in particular I found is that the YMCA has published some free at-home workouts. So if you're not a member of a gym, you can always check with uh, community resources like that. I'm going to echo that and say I believe Peloton is giving a free 90-day trial right now during Corona, and they have um, different workouts you can do. You don't have to have the bike or the treadmill. You can do outdoor workouts. They have yoga, um, indoor workouts. You don't even have to have weights. You can select um, your own body weight workouts. Uh, so it's just a nice another little resource uh, to turn to. Um, and we have one more question. 
um, any organizational tips or products for moving office to in-home in your kids' schoolwork? Really how I've been trying to keep everything organized, um, I'm just using, like, uh, speaking most specifically to kind of the schoolwork, I got really, really overwhelmed with the amount of emails that I was getting from school and even missed our first class meeting on Monday because I did not check my personal email until the end of the day. Granted, she did give us only 37 minutes notice, but everyone I know is doing their best. Um, but I, um, I'm just keeping a Google Sheet. So anything that comes in, you know, my inbox or on the various apps, for my daughter's school, I'm just loading that into um, a Google uh, Google Doc. Um, so, you know, she's got like four or five different apps and websites that we go to. So I've got all the login information. I've got all of her agendas, all of her activities. So I just try to keep that in one place um, just so I'm not having to, you know, search my inbox and, and go all over the place. So just trying to keep everything in one central location. And I did that because that kind of echoes my productivity style for work, um, you know, I try to use, you know, those sharing um, functionalities or uh, type of platforms to kind of keep all my work stuff and all my notes straight. Um, so I think that that has been really helpful. And then I think just, again, kind of back to the point of like keeping those designated areas, you know, keeping my work stuff in my work area and keeping their school stuff in their school area um, has kind of helped us even just keep up with the stuff that we have going on. Um, but I, I don't think I'm really doing much beyond that. Thank you so much for that for that tip. Um, we will go ahead and wrap it up. I don't see any more questions, but if you do have any more questions, feel free to type them in and we will get to them uh, before we close. But I want to thank everyone again for joining us and a huge thank you to our presenters. They jumped in on this opportunity to share their expertise and work quickly to get the information to us this week. They were great to work with and we truly appreciate them. I have to say it was a very organized group, um, as you can tell, because they had the tips and tricks for being organized and working at home. We will be sending a recording of today's webinar, as I said. Uh, so please take the session survey that will also be in this email. It helps us when we're developing our programming. You can learn more about our webinar series on our website, nccatoday.org, and click on the coronavirus banner at the top of the page. Please feel free to share this with anyone. They are complimentary to all. I just shared these with my brother-in-law, who's an adjunct professor at Columbia College. Um, he's never taught online before, and so I sent him a link to our webinar series, hoping it will help him develop his um, lessons online. And we are developing these in real time, so there will be changes. Please check in to our website often. We will also send you notifications if there are any changes. Our next session is tomorrow at 2.15, and it's Virtual Student Support Services. Please reach out to us if there's any other way we can serve you during this time. We have also created an online forum you can access through your member portal. You can share and, gain, share and gain useful resources during this time. Again, you can share today's experience on social using hashtags MCCA webinar, better together, and COVID-19. I want to thank everyone once again and have a great day.